We're just waiting on a couple other panelists. We're gonna give them a few more minutes and then we're gonna get started here. All right, it looks like we are getting started here. So I wanna thank everybody for coming to our Judge the Vote form. Um, we have candidates, we have um, judges already here who are running again, they are incumbents. And we just thank you for educating us on the third branch of the government. And we wanna get into um, exactly what positions everyone is wanting for, what your positions do and um, so we're gonna go around the panel and have everyone introduce themselves. Um, I'll call out some names. And um, our icebreaker question is, what obstacle, if any, do you feel as if stands in the way of justice at this moment? Um, I would like to start with Judge Aaliyah Sabri. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, I will go straight to the question. Um, I'm at 36 District Court in Detroit. So I'm a district judge. I, I'm on the traffic division. I am the presiding judge over traffic. So we, I oversee about 12 judges. We have a total of 29 right now. So it's the biggest court, district court in the state. Um, and one of the biggest obstacles, first thing that came to my mind um, is following certain laws that I don't necessarily agree with or there's no guidance. Um, what people don't understand as judges, we are supposed to follow the law. We have a law in front of us and we hear facts and we have to analyze the facts. We may not agree with anything that happened before us, but we have to look at the law, put the facts in with it. And if it fits in with what the legislature has decided is what our law is, I have to go with that decision. So I think that's one of the biggest obstacles for me for several times where I'm in court and I just, oh, I don't like, I don't like this at all. I don't like the city ordinance, but I have to follow the law. So sometimes I call state legislators and let them know how I feel about it. And hopefully that there'll be some change and some better relationships or closer relationships with our state legislators. But that's my biggest obstacle on the bench. Okay, thank you. And then we're gonna go over to Judge Noah Hood. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you again for the invite to be on tonight's panel. Uh, my name is Noah P. Hood. I'm a judge on Third Judicial Circuit of Michigan, commonly referred to as Wayne County Circuit Court. I was appointed back in 2019 and I'm running for retention uh, right now. Um, excellent question. Uh, what is the biggest obstacle to uh, justice right now? And in my personal experience, it has been, for lack of a better term, autopilot within the legal criminal legal system. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assigned to the criminal division at Wayne County Circuit Court. And there's a number of things that when I first came on the bench, the explanation that I got for certain aspects of handling cases was, this is just the way it's done. Um, to keep things moving, to, uh, for any number of reasons. And I put some examples in my response to the questionnaire uh, for example, uh, every time a sentencing hearing comes up, we get a pre-sentence investigation report and it contains more or less automatic recommendations regarding court costs and fees. Mm -hmm. One of those fees is attorney's fees. Now think about that for a second. 
at the end of a case, if it results in a conviction, one of the conditions of sentence, whether it's a prison term, a jail term, or probation with some combination of jail or not, they are assessing more or less automatically $400 in attorney's fees for individuals for whom we've already determined cannot afford a lawyer. It's completely backward, but it's not required. It's something that simply is set on autopilot. And unless you tweak it, unless you are paying attention to the different breaks within the system, people get steamrolled and their rights get steamrolled and it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. So in my experience, portions of the system that are set on autopilot that people don't bother to correct. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, let's go over to uh, Elizabeth Welch. Yeah. Oh, I just uh, so appreciate those answers from uh, two of the judges who are truly on the front lines. Um, they are the entry to the court system and they are truly the most important part of the system. Uh, so their perspective is very just spot on. Um, I, I'm running for the Supreme Court. And so um, one of the reasons I was motivated was because exactly of wanting to tackle these big system issues, which the Supreme Court can really use their platform to do that. Uh, and um, I, I just um, so appreciate Judge Hood um, as someone who we've all practiced in the system and there's some there's sort of this intransigence to change. Uh, and it can be really hard. And uh, that's, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but I have so many friends just like Judge Hood who get elected or get appointed and they get there and something that seems very logical, that doesn't sound like it would be real hard to change. It's incredibly hard. And now multiply that times 83 counties in the state uh, and try to figure out how do we do that. Um, and that is the kind of system change I'm passionate about. One of the reasons I step forward. Um, I, I want to um, focus on sort of these because because I'm running for Supreme Court. So it's that big picture. And I love that you have this mix of people um, for running at the different levels. Um, uh, the access to justice issue, the number of people, which um, the judges on this call know this, the number of people in the civil side um, who don't have attorneys, uh, it's, it's a stunning number. It's about 80% come into our courthouses and they don't have lawyers. Uh, and that is a huge problem. If you want to have integrity in the justice system, uh, people have to believe the results fair. And if one person has an attorney and another doesn't, it puts our judges in a really awkward position. They have to sort of figure out how to balance the scales without representing the unrepresented party. It takes a lot of their time. It takes a lot of the energy of the uh, clerks and the staff. Uh, and there's good programs happening around the state to help solve that, but it, 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 it's a national crisis. It's one that's become only worse since I graduated law school 25 years ago. Uh, that's one that side. Obviously we have the criminal justice side Side where I think we, we know some good changes have started. Uh, but again, you run into that bureaucratic intransigence where people are like, but we've always done it this way, but we've always done it this way. And lawyers are wonderful people. They're often very civically engaged. We are not by nature like super innovative and easily adapting to change. We are a profession that does things based on how we've done it in the past. And that very much carries into our courthouses. And I think we're at a moment where we want to reinvent things and do things differently. And that's that, that's going to take some pushing. Yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, Sandra Baker, if you could tell us what you're running for, as well as what do you believe is the biggest obstacle to justice right now? Okay. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for having me. And I'm running for Wayne County Third Circuit Court Judge. There are two openings, so I'm not challenging anyone. We have two judges that are retiring, Judge Ulysses Boykin and Judge Craig Strong. Um, what I think is the biggest obstacle, and I'm going to speak from um, a attorney aspect that does trial work on a regular basis in the prosecutor's office, I had the Wayne Arson Reduction Unit. And what that unit do, does is we handle cases where in, individuals have been killed or injured in a fire or uh, arson for profit crimes. But with respect to those serial arsons that you may see on television, um, about 75% of my defendants have mental health issues. And I think that's the big, one of the biggest obstacles we have in the criminal justice system, particularly. We have no place to put individuals that have mental health issues. And the judge is left with trying to make a decision about the public safety, as well as the individual needing help. Um, we do have a mental health program at Wayne County, but it does not take everybody. And specifically, it does not take people charged with arson, which is ironic because most of the people who I have that commit arsons have mental health issues. So we have to do something. We have to find a way 
to make sure these individuals get the help they need besides locking them up. And of course they can be in jail or in prison and be medicated, but that's not dealing with the root of the problem. And so that's what I find as one of the biz, biz, biggest obstacles. When I took over that position, I went to Prosecutor Worthy and I told her how, you know, how at unease I was because I know there were people that had cases with me um, that went to jail or prison, but I knew they still had some mental health issues. You can't argue diminished capacity in Michigan. So that means the jury doesn't know that they may have had some bipolar or schizophrenic as long as they're considered sane. If they're legally sane, they are tried like anybody else. And by the time they get to court, generally they have had medication and they are able to assist their attorney. But there are other issues that are there that may affect what they do when they are not on their medication or they're self-medicating with street drugs. So I think that that is one of the largest uh, obstacles that we have. Wayne County, Wayne County criminal justice system has become the number one provider of mental health services, and that should not be. So that is the issue. And what I would like to do about it, I um, actually have spoken to one of the judges, uh, district judge, Judge Elizabeth Tassano, who's in Wyandotte. She indicated when she took over, there wasn't a mental health program at all in Wyandotte. And she asked for a grant and sought a grant and received monies and was able to establish a mental health program. So I would like to see if maybe I could do something like that to expand ours, to see if we could get facilities to take these individuals, because a lot of them don't because of the liability issues with them. So we have to find individuals that will do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I also want to take the mo a moment to introduce co-host uh, with me, Daryl Woods. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what you believe is the biggest obstacle to justice right now, and then we'll get into the second question. Uh, absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm Daryl Woods. Uh, I am a person who's been impacted by the uh, criminal legal system. Um, I served 28 years, 11 months in prison off life without the possibility of parole sentence. I think uh, one of the biggest impediment uh, to uh, justice uh, in this state is fair-minded judges and justices on the Supreme Court. Okay. Yeah. And for for the follow-up question, Daryl, do you want to go with one of your questions? Oh, absolutely. And I think that. Uh, I know that some of you guys, I know Elizabeth Wealth, you, you're assigned time sensitive to seven o'clock, uh, but we're gonna go straight into it. And so what specialty court do you like in Wayne County and why? And what other program would you like to see added? And so I would like to ask uh, the uh, panelists to be able to answer that question and be as brief and specific as possible. So that one specifically will be uh directed to Judge Noah, Judge Sabri, and Sandra. Uh, let's let's start the other way. And so we'll go with Noah, if you can answer first for me. I'm sorry, I got a little bit of feedback when you were reading your question. Can you just repeat it one more time? What specialty court do you like in Wayne County and why? And what other program would you like to see added? Uh, I'll say that I probably it's an unfair preference, but I have a preference for the uh, Swift and Sure Sanctions uh, Probation Program. Uh, in part because that's the specialty court that I preside over. Um, if it was up to me, I would tweak the name of the program because I think it puts a little too much emphasis on the stick and not enough emphasis on the carrot. Uh, the Swift and Short Sanctions Program is a specialty court docket designed for individuals who We'll say are high risk and high need, high risk of recidivism, uh, meaning that they've had issues adjusting to probation and high need, meaning they, at least in the view of the court system, would benefit from additional supervision. And frankly, uh, part of my job is made easier by having really talented service providers associated with that program. Part of it is mental health. Uh, making sure that people get mental health services that they need while they're on probation. Uh, I can say anecdotally, in my experience as a federal prosecutor, one of the best indicators of whether or not someone would catch a future case, and we're measuring this just by new arrest, was a successful completion of a program of cognitive behavioral therapy. 
and mental health is one component of the SWIFT Insure Sanction Program. Uh, another component is sanction, and the emphasis is on SWIFT rather than severe. Uh, the idea that instead of waiting, you know, weeks before addressing an issue, um, you're addressing it right then, so that there isn't this cognitive break between conduct uh, and sanction. Um, I will say that um, we've had mixed results with the SWIFT Insure Sanction Program. And in my view, you know, the question, what, what's my favorite or which one do I think is the best? I think they work well when all are running at the same time because they end up serving slightly different communities. And uh, right now our program is working well. We, we've had to tweak it with COVID uh, to make sure that we're not unnecessarily putting people back in the jail but it's, uh, it's a good program and uh, I'm excited to be on that court. So SWIFT and truer sanctions, um, can you tell me what that actually means? Absolutely. So for probationers and supervisees who have had problems on probation, who are, they've had a number of probation violations, whether they're on my docket or another judge's docket, can be referred to the SWIFT and SURE docket. And okay. Once they get referred to our docket, I'm the judge that supervises their case. And it starts with a warning hearing. During that warning hearing, I explain the program and explain that for certain types of misconducts, uh, there are, there's a formula for sanctions that aren't exactly immediate, but are in close proximity to when the misconduct occurs. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's added supervision and uh, added access to treatment. So you kind of have both things running at the same time. Okay. Uh, it creates a number of incentives, both pushes and pulls, to make sure that people are showing up to take their drug tests, showing up to mental health treatment, showing up to work, um, and at the same time, providing the support structure for barriers to that, transportation, housing, um, any number of things that might prevent someone from finding a job, maintaining a job, uh, or succeeding as they re-enter our community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very kindly. Uh, just a brief. Uh, the whole time, I'll, I'll we'll go to Sandra. Um, Carlton, can you unmute Judge Shabri for me? Whenever you guys mute yourselves, we have to unmute you. So <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So do you want me to go ahead? Yes, okay. All right. Um, I What I do like right now is I like the drug court and I like the mental health court as it in that it does provide an option. But what I do think needs to happen is it needs to be extended. And as I indicated previously, we need to be able to get more people in it than are able to get in it now. Um, and so that is what I would indicate. I also like diversion programs. If there are, and those are usually given to crimes where there is a money monetary value, like you, you know, there's some credit card fraud or <clears throat> um, I don't know, um, welfare fraud or something along those lines, those kind of crimes, you can generally pay back the money. And then once that is paid back, it could be dismissed. Um, now, of course, you got the issue of, you know, do they have a job in order to pay back the money? And so, of course, at that point, we may need to look at other things that may help an individual to get um, employed if they're not employed. But anything that can keep people out of a confined situation where it doesn't have to be that kind of situation. Yeah. Um, Judge Sabri? I'm unmuted. Yay. <laughs> okay, so at 36th District Court, a lot of people don't know this. We have five different specialty courts. We have uh, drug court, we have street court, veterans court, and we have our newest uh, courts, mental health court and human trafficking. Um, I was one of the street court judges, and that was one of the programs we had for people who were homeless or at risk for homelessness. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that um, they just had so many other obstacles that paying a traffic ticket was the last thing that they were worried about. 
Like they didn't have transportation to get to court. They didn't have, you know, bus fare. They didn't have a place to live. They were moving from place to place, very transient. So if they were driving a vehicle, it didn't have insurance or it didn't, it was just so many issues. And street court, which, when I learned is that um, we were able to do a holistic everything approach. If you have parking tickets, water bills, anything you had going on, we would just take everything and put it all in one program. We need you to just put a little effort in, try to uh, look for employment or look for housing and help them through a process. And after 90 days, we would go ahead and waive all their fines and costs. The parking department would waive or give them some type of payment plan. So it was a pretty feel good program. Um, but my favorite right now is the human trafficking program. And I say that because before we had this court, um, there were a lot of women coming before us with what we call OTE cases, offer to engage the services of another for an act of prostitution charge. And the women would be stigmatized as being, you know, mm -hmm. hoes, sluts, you don't think about, or immoral people, but you don't think about where they come from, what type of circumstances that they're dealing with, whether they're being forced into this, all of the things outside of the actual act on that day. So with the human trafficking program, we're able to refer women who have these charges they're dealing with, you know, soliciting, can go to human trafficking court, get some treatment, some therapy, and have some, a lot of times, freedom from their pimps or people who are controlling them and give them a chance to have some hope and just some value and feel how they should feel about themselves and not being penalized in court for doing something that they got caught up in. And it's just, to me, that's my favorite one because I, with women, sometimes we get treated a lot harder and harshly in court and we should be doing this and we're more supposed to be more responsible. Uh, but we have a lot going on at 36. And I think the biggest issue we have is referring and identifying who these people are. So sometimes you have someone come, we have a lot of people, it's like a factory at 36 district court. So on any day we can have um, 30 people come before you or come before me. And I don't get to always know if someone has a mental health issue or whether someone's a victim of human trafficking or has drug issues. So it's important, I think, to I always try to relate to my colleagues, which a lot of them do, to ask questions. You gotta do a little more than just read the case off, enter a guilty plea, sentence them, and to see what's going on with their life because you could actually change it for the better. So um, we're trying at 36, but uh, I think that our biggest issue is identifying uh, those who have the issues. Okay. And then um, uh, Ms. Elizabeth Welch, are there programs in the Supreme Court that correspond with this? Can you tell us a little bit about them and then which is your favorite, which would you tweak? Yeah, and it, this th this stuff is all at the trial court level. Uh, the Supreme Court is there to hopefully champion these programs and help expand them. Uh, one of the this is budgets are constrained, and so this is one of the frustrating parts. These programs work; we know they work. They take an upfront investment, and of course, save society so much money in the long run. Plus, there's just the moral piece; it's the right thing to do. Uh, you know, I believe courts should help solve problems, uh, not just put a problem in jail, you know, and I suspect that the uh, judges who are here and the candidates here all really believe that we want to help solve a problem. And that's what those problem solving courts are designed to do. The frustrating part about the problem solving courts for me, because I'm traveling all over the state now, whether by Zoom or in person, both, um, is obviously some people have access to these and some don't, depending on where you live. So the goal would be to expand these as much as possible uh, and figure out how to get as many people. So, you know, um, Judge Sabri is just talking about, you know, trying to expand this just within Wayne uh, and getting more people or in her court, you know, there's just, there's a huge need. So we know just like everything that's, you know, really important, uh, you got to pay for it. So uh, this is where we've got to convince, you know, um, you can get the grant from the Supreme Court, you know, they, their, their administrative office gives grants to help get these programs started, super important. Eventually, then they have to get assumed into the budgets. Um, and, uh, you know, that means who runs county government matters a lot. Uh, and, you know, depending mm -hmm. on where these courts sit. Um, and I, I think the good news is, I think we're at a moment, people get that these courts work. So, 
I take, for example, addiction court. Um, you know, most areas have some sort of, whether it's drug court or, you know, addiction court. Um, every, just about every family is impacted by that issue. So people get that. And I think they've seen it works. So I don't think people have to sell people on, oh, I, this is a really good idea. But now we're expanding bigger. We're into mental health court where there's a lot of overlap there with the addiction court. Um, you know, and now we're into veterans court and, you know, dealing with homeless populations and all these specialty courts, which we know work, um, but it's still, you've got to bring people along. And then the other piece is you need a champion. So, you know, uh, Chandra's talking about, uh, you know, how she's talking to a different judge who changed champion and got it going, which is fantastic. That's exactly why your local judges matter. But what do you do if someone's not champion it and really doing the heavy lifting mm -hmm. to get this going when we know it's a great idea? So we, we need, again, who you elect matters at that, at that uh, district court and circuit court level a lot. Yeah. Um, so my next question will, will be for everyone. Um, what do you believe is the cause of the high crime rates in minority um, incarceration? In our communities, um, well, I'll start with you again, Ms. Welch. Sure, um, I think um, it's there's a lot of data on this. I think we know we have. Um, I, I mean, there's obviously long-term systemic issues that have resulted in uh, poverty in different parts of our population all over the state and nation, uh, and then we have uh, policing that has been heavy in certain communities. So, um, I, I mean, I'll be the first to say, I live in a predominantly white suburban community where kids engage in the exact same behaviors as kids down the road. Uh, there just aren't the same number of police following people around um, or maybe, you know, uh, penalizing someone more severely or picking them up and taking them down to the jail. Uh, whereas someone else would get a pass maybe in a different community. So I think there's that. Uh, there's also, we know, um, from uh, that, that some of these uh, reasons people are landing in jail are, are, are very minor offenses. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the bulk of it actually. Uh, so we know from the pretrial incarceration report, the jail and pretrial incarceration task force, that one of the primary reasons people are getting picked up and put in jail, like do not pass go, you go right to the jail is a suspended driver's license. So, mm -hmm. uh, and we know that is going to disproportionately impact people who have less money. Uh, they're driving their car to take their kid to school or to go to work and they have a suspended driver's license because of some fee they didn't pay that has nothing to do with their driving record uh, in their landing in jail. So, uh, and that has disproportionately affected black and brown people. I mean, the data is clear on that. So that's just one example. Um, there's certainly many more. Yeah. Um, let's jump over to uh, Judge Sabri. Okay, I will piggyback on what um, Elizabeth said. Um, the reason for the high crime rate, I think we all know those stats, but just to state them, we have lack of opportunities in the city of Detroit. We have, unfortunately, what I would consider subpar education right now, lack of funding, lack of resources with our public schools, even our charter schools. Um, unemployment rate is um, a problem. So you have crimes of, you know, where people are in need. And a lot of people don't understand, a lot of judges don't understand that, especially those who never had to deal with those experiences. So the basic concept of someone stealing an object to feed their child, you know, incarcerating for some, someone for that. So we have a lot of that going on. We have also because people just don't value their lives or value their future. So they commit crimes because they're like, I don't care what happens to me. Put me away in jail. I've been there before. It's nothing. I don't care. So that's part of the reason of the high crime rate. And I think the reason for the high rate of incarceration also, as Elizabeth said, um, and I know this being on the traffic division, you know, it's a misdemeanor to not have insurance, right? It's a misdemeanor to not have registration. It's a misdemeanor to not have a, a license. So I call it at the district court because it's a circuit court is different, but a district court, the trifecta for traffic is those three. So at any moment, if you don't have any of those things in order, you could be stopped by the police, which has happened to me because I didn't have my stuff transferred properly. You could have your car impounded, which costs money, and it goes into the impound lot. You can't get it out because every day it costs more, and you can be incarcerated. If a bond is posted that you cannot pay, then you sit in jail until you see a judge, which could be 30 days later. So we have this mass incarceration issue for things that people should not be incarcerated for. 
there's no threat to society when someone does not have their car insurance or because it can't pay for it. We all know the city of Detroit has been redlined and we can't pay for car insurance because of that. So I think that the mass incarceration issue is huge. And I would like to, of course, plug 36 district court and let everyone know that we do not issue um, warrants that allow people to be picked up and incarcerated on those issues. We do not incarcerate, or our bonds are at zero dollars right now. I think COVID has really opened the eyes of a lot of people, especially because of the issue of people actually passing away and dying in there, that we had to come to some type of quick agreement. And I never incarcerated because I just don't understand going to jail for no insurance. Mm -hmm. But I think the other people have um, finally bought in with the, with the idea of these, the incarceration should be left for people who have certain issues like domestic violence or, you know, drunk driving third time where you hit a car and you hit someone else for those type of issues where they need to sit down for a minute. Mm -hmm. But um, the good news is a lot of people are waking up and realizing that you shouldn't be incarcerating folks for traffic offenses. Yeah. And then let's jump over to Sandra Baker. You know, I would have to echo everything that's been said. I actually did read the task um, report that was um, championed by Governor Whitmer, that was um, chaired by Justice McCormick and Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. And it opened my eyes. I, it indicated that our jail population has tripled in the last 40 years, but yet the crime rate has not. And then I found out that, you know, certain things, I don't generally deal with lower level issues. So I wasn't aware that if you miss child support payments, that's an arrestable offense. So you have people in, sitting in jail for child support payments. Well, now they've lost their job. So now how are they gonna make the child support payments? So again, I will piggyback on everything that's been said. And a, lot of that, a lot of that goes to the legislature. So you have to also think about who you're voting and putting into the legislature because that's who's making those laws and giving you whatever the results or the consequences are of these different things. Some things just should not be um, something that you can get arrested for. It should just be a ticket and you have to show up and you know you need to do whatever it is you need to do. So I think um, I pretty much go along with what everybody else has said. Thank you. And then Judge Noah. Well, I, I hate to be the contrarian, but um, I just <laughs> whether or not there is in fact a high, whether or not we know what the crime rate is. Right. Feedback over here. Um, Hey, Daryl, it's saying that you have two that are on and one is creating static. Can you mute them? Yeah, I think that's Camilla. Uh, oh, okay. From the NAACP. Okay. Yeah. You may have just saved me from myself because I'm about to say something that's going to sound crazy. I just okay. think that there's a high crime rate. Um, I think we know what the arrest rate is. I think we know what the conviction rate is. Um, we don't there's a bunch of crimes that are happening right now in our community and in other communities that never get, a, never result in arrests, never result in prosecution, never result in conviction. Tons of crimes against children and fraud crimes, frankly, so-called white collar crime. Um, and so I think you may find that particularly in certain zip codes, there is a high crime rate or a high arrest rate and a high conviction rate for carrying concealed weapons. When in other zip codes, the same crimes are occurring, they just don't result in arrest, they don't result in a prosecution, and they don't result in conviction. So I dispute that there is in fact a higher crime rate. I think we have a higher arrest rate, a higher prosecution rate, and a higher conviction rate. But there's a bunch of crimes that are being committed right now in other places and other types of crimes that don't get the same attention or resources, and primarily, those are crimes against children and so-called white collar crime. Yeah. It didn't sound that crazy. I'm gonna be honest with you. I was expecting something a little crazier. I thought it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Dara, you wanna jump in with your next question? Yes. Uh, what would be your judicial philosophy and temperament? Uh, so I will uh, direct that to uh, Sandra Baker first and then go to Elizabeth. And uh, just some brief ladies first, uh, Mr. Hood. Oh, I feel like we're saying your name wrong each, or can you say one more time for me? I'm sorry. My it's name actually is actually Chandra. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I've been called it all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's actually Chandra Baker. Thank you. Um, well, I think um, I'm pretty even tempered. So I have uh, uh, the ability to let a lot of stuff slide. And I think main thing is I want to be respectful to everybody that comes before me. Um, and I also want to be a timely judge, which is something that I think is extremely important um, because other people take time out of their day or from their job to come down to have matters heard. And I think it's unfair for somebody not to take the bench to 11 o'clock and we're supposed to start at nine. So I will be there and I will be timely and prepared. And that's the other thing. I make sure I have read what has been brought before me and am ready to deal with what issues are before me. So um, that is what I think I will be when I'm on the bench. <laughs> Thank you. Great, um, and I'll jump in. Um, so because I'm running for an appellate position where it's my job will be to review other decisions that have been made before, um, it's sort of the thing we get asked is sort of what would your standard for review be or when would you overturn a case or, um, and of course there's no clean perfect answer. answer. Chandra, um, or actually I think it was uh, Judge Sabri noted that judges hands are often tied because of the law is clear. Even if you don't like the law, I mean, that's, you know, a judge, regularly has to and you see that in appellate decisions a lot they there's usually a footnote where they don't like the result but their hands are tied now there are exceptions there are times the law is unconstitutional uh and we have plenty of examples of that through history where the courts have found a law that's in place uh is is wrong because it, it violates people's rights so i am certainly someone who um i would say i am cut from the uh the late great Justice Ginsburg cloth. Um, I do believe in equal protection under the law. I believe that our constitution is there to protect all human beings. Uh, but I also believe that all human beings need fair access to the courts. So beyond just the philosophy of how I would decide a case, I would take the job incredibly seriously at the Supreme Court to figure out the challenge of how do we assure fair access and whether fair access is making sure everybody is treated the same, um, regardless of race or income level uh, in a criminal matter, uh, or if that access to justice issue in the civil matter, that is something I think the Supreme Court justices need to really lead on. Thank you. Okay, so me next. Um, I'm going into my fourth year on the bench. So um, I think I've had the same philosophy and temperament when I started. I'm very simple to the point, but my big thing is respect. So um, just because you committed a crime or allegedly committed a crime that I think is disgusting or I think that is awful, you have, still have to respect the person. They're still a human being. Um, being on time, that's a big thing for me. So I can say Chandra and I used to work together at the prosecutor's office. And uh, we even tried a case together. I could get in more details about that. But we know who the judges are who start on time and who don't. So we could do our 8.30. We start here, 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10, make it all the way to 11. So I pride myself on being one of those 8.30 judges. At the latest, 8.45. I may be doing something administratively, but I'm big on not wasting people's time and getting mm -hmm. it, get it over with. Let's let's move on. And as far as my temperament, I always tell people, and I think people can attest to it who've been in my courtroom, I'm very peaceful. It's a courtroom of peace. I always say that. You know, there's no need to be stressed out. Uh, you may come in that way. I always take people as they are, but it's my responsibility to set the tone. You have people come in angry. I've been cussed out before. I've been called all type of names, but I always just, you know what? I don't know where they've come from and you hear their stories and I'm the one, I'm supposed to be the bigger person when I'm in the black robe, I'm making the big bugs. So I can at least just, you know, hear that what they have to say, hear their story and still treat them. And by the time they leave, change their lives for the better and see that, you know, you don't have to come in here like that. And a lot of times it's because of experiences they have had in other courtrooms. So I always try to change that experience for people. So I always want people to leave with a positive experience. And even if you pled guilty to something, even if I had to impose some type of fine or probation, you at least leave with a positive experience. Say I was treated well, uh, we were efficient, it was effective, and I don't have anything negative to say, and I just messed up. Thank you. 
I guess it's my turn. Um, it, I take those as two separate parts. One, uh, what's your judicial ph philosophy? And one, what is your temperament? And I like to think that I'm pretty even keeled. Um, I'm sure Judge Sabri can empathize with this, but on any given day, there's any number of extreme and troubling things that we'll have to see and deal with. And, you know, you're, the reality is when people walk in our courtroom, they're walking in on the worst day of their lives. And so it's important to be prepared, to be ready to go, and to treat them with dignity and respect. Um, Attorney Baker, it, when, when she said it, I'm sure there's people that are listening right now that are saying, what's the big deal about starting on time? What's the big deal about reading the briefs? I can't tell you in the past year and a half how many different lawyers and stakeholders in the court system have told me that it's refreshing to practice in front of me because I actually read read the briefs and I'm ready to go, uh, ready to, I'm not an 8.30 judge, I, I, we open and we're ready to go at nine o'clock. Um, but it's nine o'clock every morning, and at least until COVID, uh, where they put me at one o'clock, but it's at one o'clock, we're ready to go. And that's something where it seems like such a small lift, um, but really, you know, when people come in, this is the most important thing in their life that's going on. And we've got to be there being fair and listening and paying attention to every single aspect, because sometimes it may seem really simple but a case will be made or broken on a very technical, very nuanced thing that requires a lot of work behind the scenes before you open up court. And uh, I commit to doing that every single time. Um, I wanna, so my next question is do, um, it's for everybody as well. And I know um, Elizabeth Welch will have to jump off soon. So thank you, we'll um, start with you. Um, do you believe there's a such thing as a victimless crime? And if so, can you give me what you think is an example of that? Oh, um, I think, um, I, I mean, there are certainly times where, you know, society is harmed as a whole. Um, you know, those are tough, uh, <laughs> Those are, are tough search of circumstances. Obviously, the courts mostly deal with direct direct issues, but we have, um, um, you know, I my world is I, I'm on the civil side of things. So I was married to a criminal defense lawyer for 20 years. So I, I, I sort of lived it at the kitchen table every single night. So, uh, but I do think um, there are times that um, that there are. There are certainly instances where um, society is impacted. I mean, the, the victim is society, right? Um, I, you, the criminal justice system is mostly dealing with direct issues. Um, you know, certainly uh, we've got white collar crimes, um, but you know, usually I'd say there are victims with that. It's just harder to name them. Maybe uh, certainly we see. I, I, I think a lot of white collar crimes sort of get treated that way. Uh, and um, we have a lot of uh, um, where you can't figure out who who's harmed, but certainly people are. Um, I, yeah, so I, I don't, that is not something that, um, I, I guess I don't have a particularly great answer on that one. So, I mean, most of the, obviously, I think a lot of the system is geared towards actually, you know, our system is geared very much towards uh, you know, somebody commits a crime and there's a victim. That is our system. Um, and um, that's mostly where our system is. Okay. Um, Sandra, right? Sandra, sorry. Um, that, that is a hard one. I will tell you because I do arson and some of the cases that I do are arson for profit crimes. And I have to make sure when I'm in trial to get the jury to care because many people don't like insurance companies. <laughs> so, and when you're talking arson for profit crimes, what has happened is, is they are basically duped the insurance company. So, so what I have to get people to understand though is, even though your victim there is the insurance company, what does it do to your neighborhood? Because if I own businesses in your neighborhood and I use people in the neighborhood to burn it, who I pay off, I'm not rebuilding that. I've left your neighborhood with blight, 
And now you, there are more reasons why your insurance rates are high and your property taxes are low. So I think there's always some victim. Um, it just may, as Attorney Welch has indicated, not be someone that people feel personal about. And so as me being an advocate, that's what I always think about, okay, who is the victim? So I'm not sure if there is a victim less crime, but I think the victims may not necessarily be people per se. They may be institutions and they may be institutions that people don't care that much about, but I do still think that um, for most part, most crimes have some type of victim. Yeah, and then Judge Hood. I can give you two examples right off the bat and there may be dispute about this from a conceptual standpoint, but Karen, I would describe carrying a concealed weapon as a victimless crime. Now, folks may dispute that. They may say that, oh, well, there may be some victim in the future. This isn't minority report. This isn't some predictive modeling or proactive prosecution. CCW is largely a victimless crime. And I think if you're looking outside of the state system, illegal reentry of a previously deported alien is also a victimless crime. Despite that, it is still the most frequently prosecuted federal crime in the United States. About 25% of all federal criminal cases are illegal reentry of a previously removed alien. I think those are examples. I think there's a bunch of other examples where it gets a little bit more controversial. Arguably, felon in possession of a firearm is a victimless crime. Now, you may have folks that will say, well, there's a victim that's coming up. If it's someone who's got a felony that you know, is possessing a firearm, there's, a, there's going to be a victim. I'm not so certain that that's the case, particularly if the underlying felony is, for example, carrying a concealed weapon, where essentially you've now got two convictions for what amount to regulatory offenses. Um, you know, I, I would also just throw out there as a former uh, fraud prosecutor, many, many, if not all fraud crimes have victims. Now, whether or not it's a victim you want to root for, as Ms. Baker said, totally different story. But uh, those are a couple examples that immediately jump out to me. Yeah. Judge Sabri? So I will say that um, I think most crimes do have a victim, whether it's easy to identify or somewhere way down the line. Mm -hmm. But um, I agree with uh, Judge Hood on the CCW. Um, and then I'm thinking about in our court, no registration. I mean, that's a crime. It's a misdemeanor. You can go to jail for 93 days for that. Um, no insurance. I mean, the only victim would be insurance companies and nobody really cares about that. Um, but also <laughs> possession of drug use when it's recreational, um, when it's a recreational drug use case the only victim would be the person using it. And that's why we have these courts to try to help them with treatment um, back to prostitution. You have these women who are being charged with crimes for prostitution. There's no victim. They just need the help. Um, and lastly, you have like what we call EWAP, the entering without owner's permission when it's a case where there's a vacant building that the owner mm -hmm. has failed to secure and you have homeless people who don't have a place to stay, who are just looking for housing for the night, who have not damaged, scrapped, or done anything to the building. I, I consider those victimless as well. Those are considered to me shelter type cases who also need help in some type of specialty work. Yeah, thank you. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge Camelia Landrum with Detroit uh, NAACP. Can you unmute yourself or Carlton, can you unmute her for us? Yeah. I <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm doing quite well. It is a busy day out in the field, but I'm really excited to be here and just to um, tune in uh, to some of our leadership that currently sits on the bench and those that are seeking um, opportunities to join. So thank you all for allowing us to be a part uh, and for uh, being here this evening. Thank you so much for being in partnership with us and to everybody for joining. Daryl, what's your next question? Uh, uh, very quickly, I got a couple more minutes with uh, Elizabeth. Uh, and I can stay a little past seven. I just have to. I have to get on something by seven fifteen. So yeah. So uh, absolutely. Can You're we bring in Rebecca Coleman? Yeah. She just jumped on. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Um, Miller versus Alabama prevents juveniles from being sentenced to life without parole automatically. Mm -hmm. 
what are your thoughts about juveniles being sentenced as adults? What are, what are your personal views of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Miller, uh, you know, certainly was an important precedent that basically is saying, you know, it's unconstitutional to sentence juveniles to life without parole unless there's extraordinary circumstances. Um, now, in Michigan, um, and I know the Chief Justice will be joining soon, uh, she uh, wrote actually a strong dissent in, op in opinion, uh, I believe the court decided four to three, uh, regarding how Miller is basically being interpreted in our state. Um, and so in Michigan, um, you have these Miller hearings for people who reach, you know, um, adulthood to determine whether they, you know, are that, that exception to the rule. And, um, the interpretation is pretty broad in that um, juveniles are being allowed to be sent back to prison without life without parole uh, at a much higher rate in Michigan, largely because of the Supreme Court, uh, the way they're interpreting, um, the way they're doing the Miller hearings and the evidence they're considering. Uh, and the end result is our state has more juveniles without serving life without parole than any other state in the country. Uh, so um, obviously that 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 is a troublesome statistic. Uh, so um, I obviously don't want to get into the nuances of the opinion or anything that could come before the court if I had to decide that issue. But certainly that is a statistic that should trouble anybody. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sandra. This this is the same thing again. As as a judicial candidate, we are also bound by the same rules as those individuals that are already on the bench and that we can't really give opinions as to what could possibly come before the court. But I would just echo what Attorney Welch has just indicated. And I'm going to pitch it to uh, my co-hosts to be able to ask the next question because I know that is more so for those who are running for the Supreme Court. She gave me that look, did y'all see it? <laughs> <laughs> So um, I would like to know what kind of community programs you are involved in currently, especially those that um, impact our population, Black and Brown communities. Um, if you could tell us a little bit how you're connected, that would be great. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I know I didn't get a chance to really tell a little bit about myself. So, so my day job is that I'm, I'm an employment law attorney. I help. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pause you just one second. Um, Carlton, can you please bring in uh, Justice, M Justice McCormick as well as Rebecca Coleman, please? I'm sorry, please. Continue. No, no problem. So my day job is I am an employment law attorney and I've done that for 25 years, but I, st I started with large law firms and then uh, started my own practice a long time ago, which gave me the flexibility to do some criminal defense and some abuse and neglect work as well. Uh, but I work mostly with individuals uh, and nonprofits and small businesses at employment. Now, uh, I work with, so in that capacity, I do a lot of nonprofit for um, uh, organization or a lot of pro bono work for organizations that are in the social justice spaces uh, in West Michigan. So I have the privilege of counseling a lot of those groups. They are employers, so I help them. Uh, but then um, I think uh, really importantly is where I've spent a lot of time the last 20 years. I have been a passionate public school advocate fighting for equitable outcomes for our kids and equity in education. Started out locally in West Michigan. Uh, but that work really expanded statewide, found myself in the state capitol fighting. Um, I, I was very involved with uh, fighting back. So it was called the EAA, the Education Achievement Authority. Uh, Detroit Public was under that. Uh, there were many of us involved with that, that is gone now. Um, and it, that was a long fight uh, for a variety of reasons. And we were able to really get a broad coalition of urban, suburban, and rural districts fighting back um, against some of those policies. We additionally um, worked, um, I was invited to be part of something called the School Finance Research Collaborative, which studied the true cost to educate children in the state of Michigan. Um, and there's, there's now, the, the study has been done and uh, the whole state is essentially underfunding kids, but particularly kids in districts um, that definitely uh, implement, that impact a lot of black and brown populations where there's been disinvestment, uh, kids may be arriving with different struggles than other parts of the state and needing uh, more supports. And so this funding is all about 
uh, what does a child need, not just equal funding. So if a child comes to school and maybe uh, some communities, for example, have higher English language learners. So they're certainly going to need more supports to get those kids caught up. Uh, kids, you know, districts that have higher free and reduced lunch, um, we, you know, giving, they have this like allocation formula that they're advocating for and other states have done this. Massachusetts actually did this and it had great success. So I was really involved um, with um, really focused on public schools. And then the, the other big place I um, did a lot of work, I actually had the privilege of working with the NAACP over here in Grand Rapids, uh, a voter protection work. So I've been in the voter protection space really since 2004, but I oversaw efforts in 2016 and 2018 in Kent County ending with over 200 people out at the polls, uh, working really proactively with city clerks to make sure they were really ready and we could troubleshoot before there was a problem. Um, and then really trying hard to make sure we got those voter protection volunteers. Uh, probably a big change I implemented was we've had changing demographics uh, in our sort of suburbs and realizing that um, sometimes the clerk's offices and the elected officials in the those particular communities don't reflect uh, the electorate and um, wanting to make sure those voters uh, had ac equal access to the ballot and um, had protection at the polls. So we put a lot of people in those communities too for the first time back in uh, 2016 and 2018 and found some distressing things and realized we needed to uh, do some more proactive work with those clerks to make sure they were guaranteeing people's right to vote. Uh, did a lot of work with getting, making sure, I just this week was helping people at the Kent County Jail, making sure they knew by Monday they could register online to vote. Uh, I was on with my ex-husband and he's a criminal defense lawyer and he was texting me and we were working hard to make sure a bunch of people could get registered to vote. So uh, I still, I can't quite let go of that work. I love it dearly. Um, it's a little different this cycle because I'm on the ballot, but so those are two big areas I'm really passionate about that I've spent a lot of time in that space. Thank you, uh, Ms. Welch. Uh, uh, definitely um, impressive. Uh, I want the revised version from everyone else. <laughs> oh, great. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 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 Judge uh, Sabri. So I will give you the revised version. Um, I'm sad, and of course, with COVID, we haven't been able to get into the community like we, or like I used to. Um, my main thing, I've always wanted to mentor young women. So what I, I have a group of about 12 young women that I constantly mentor who have different needs. Um, they want to talk about relationships, want to talk about resumes, talk about school, talk about parents. So I let them have their time with me. Um, they come to the court, they visit, they meet my colleagues. So I have that core group. And then I'm also part of uh, Brilliant Detroit, where I tutor students on how to read in Southwest Detroit. That's where I live. So I've learned that we have an issue with literacy in the city of Detroit. Um, I also do uh, Kiwanis Club volunteer events. So a lot of dealing once again with literacy and donating books, going to the warehouse on the weekends on Milwaukee Street and stamping them and then passing them out to the community. I coach girls basketball. I haven't what? now because I played in college. So that's, okay. what, that's what, like passion for me. But, you know, sometimes women always get forgotten. Or I shouldn't say sometimes women get forgotten. And um, I always want to invest my time in young women and young girls because I had an experience and I was allowed to go to college and play for free. And the experience I had helped me get through law school and prosecutor's office and wherever I went. So I love to share that. And then anytime anyone asks me what I'm doing or if I have any time, I would. I do big brother, big sister. So if anyone ever calls or if it's anything that I'm needed at, I just show up and I kind of just go wherever I'm needed. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Justice Abri. And I do want to acknowledge our Chief Justice uh, Bridget McCormick. It's good to have you here. Uh, and we yeah. also have uh, Rebecca Coleman as well. Good to have you both. Thanks for having me. Yes, and uh, so we're gonna to go to uh, uh, Sandra Baker. You. Okay. I am currently a board member on a Citadel Community Organization, um, which handles, it's out of Citadel Community Church, and they do a lot of programming in the Bright Brightmore area, which is an area that has a um, kind of a lower economic area. And so they do transitional housing, for individuals that are coming out of um, incarceration 
or um, women who need to be um, have some place to stay because of personal situations going on. Um, they have programs for seniors as well as for teenagers. Um, the, in the organization also, they feed individuals in the community every other Saturday. Um, I'm also a part of SOAR and I haven't done SOAR in the last year and a half when I've been out here campaigning since October of last year. But SOAR is a literacy program that started out of my church, Grace Community Church. Um, and statistics have shown that if children are not reading by the third grade at grade level, generally they start to drop off and start to um, drop out of school as they get older. So what the program does is we have Detroit Public School kids that came into the church and we tutored them twice a week in reading. And generally by the end of the school year, those kids were generally reading at grade level or above. That program has since expanded. Um, we it went into other churches and now it actually, we have some Detroit public schools that are part of them. Of course, this is COVID, so everything is being done virtually, but I'm not a part of it this year, but I've been a part of that as well. Um, I'm also a Sunday school teacher. And also when I go to uh, Wayne State every year for their uh, program that they have for individuals to come and talk to you about different positions or jobs that they're looking for, I always take on a new student and help them out with respect to their career as well. And when I was at the law firm, I did pro bono work in family uh, division. I received the Legal Aid and Defenders Impact on Domestic Violence Award. That was a while back. And I also used to volunteer for an organization called Save Kids of Incarcerated Parents, in which one or more of the children's parents were incarcerated. And we used to take them on different outings to places that they may not have an opportunity to go. And we also brought in speakers that looked like them but did other things besides being an athlete or an entertainer. So we brought in lawyers and judges and doctors and, and professors and different people to talk to them to let them know that the world was much bigger than what they may have seen in their neighborhood. Absolutely, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Judge Hood. Uh, I'll also give the uh, short version uh, outside of work. Uh, I really spend most of my time uh, with the Deacon Board at my church. Uh, which provides uh, a variety of uh, volunteer services in the area around our church, which is uh, 600 East Warren, so Warren and I-75. Uh, up until recently, I was on the board for Inside Out, which is a nonprofit that provides uh, poetry programming to Detroit public schools. It's a program that I was actually uh, part of as a student when I was at Cass Tech. Uh, Actually, not, not to name drop, but Big Sean and I were both in the same. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he just dropped. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, previously, also in private practice, I, I busied myself with pro bono work, including uh, work with Michigan Community Legal Resources. Uh, I, I guess now it's Michigan Community Resources, but then it was Michigan Community Legal Resources doing nuisance abatement. Uh, this is before the city really had much of an interest in nuisance abatement and also working among other things on juvenile lifer uh, projects. This is in the area, but after Miller versus Alabama, but before Montgomery versus Louisiana, which is a really frustrating time, Mr. Woods, I'm sure you're aware, so. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you, uh, uh, Judge Hood. Uh, do you rap too? Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, into nah. all of that. So we're gonna uh, <laughs> we're gonna pass the same question over uh, to Chief Justice McCormick. Uh, we're asking about what community work you do, um, especially that that impacts our communities, uh, Black and Brown communities. Um, and you mean work outside of my day job? So no, you don't want to hear. About I know you're Superwoman right now, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes think some of the some of the work I've had the privilege and the honor of being able to do in my day job, like co-chairing the governor's task force on jail and pretrial incarceration and uh, the Justice for All task force, which is aimed at the civil justice gaps are pretty important uh, and they've mm -hmm. been pretty time consuming. But um, uh, when I'm not working, uh, I, uh, I, I uh, serve on my local Families Against Narcotics Board, the Washtenaw County Board, um, and the Kids Kicking Cancer Board. Um, I deliver myself personally Meals on Wheels on Tuesdays. I actually go deliver meals to shut-ins in Ann Arbor. Nobody, no, none of my clients know that it's me, so please don't tell them. Okay. <laughs> um, they're probably not watching. Um, uh, 
Um, and throughout the course of my career, I've obviously, I've, I've, I, I, before I was on the bench, I spent a career representing people who couldn't afford lawyers. And my first job was as a public defender. And then uh, every clinical program I uh, founded after that was all on behalf of people who couldn't afford lawyers. And in my free time, I did, I spent a lot of time uh, anytime anybody invited me to come speak to people in uh, the uh, in MDoc, I did that a lot. I did. I spoke to the lifers a lot. Um, last fall, I ran the Chad Tough 5K at Cotton Facility with the with the guys at Cotton. Um, so I, I I do like to spend my my uh, free time doing stuff that benefits my community. Um, I wish I had a little more free time. I guess I would say that. And then we're also going to pass the same question to um, Rebecca. I'm sorry, uh, Justice McCormick. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what you're running for? Your you didn't get to do your introduction and everything. I'm sorry. No, but that's my fault because I was up, coming late from another meeting. But I'm uh, really glad to be here. Glad to be part of this conversation. Glad to see so many of my friends um, and colleagues on here. Um, I am running for re-election. I was elected to the court in 2012 um, and I'm on the ballot this year for re-election and it's been an honor to serve. Uh, the court obviously makes important decisions that affect all of our families, but in addition to the decisions it makes, the administrative oversight work gives us a tremendous opportunity to make a difference in the kind of justice, the quality of justice um, we, we, we can deliver in courtrooms throughout the state where so many people are impacted. Um, so I'm, I'm honored to be part of this conversation and uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. And I do need to uh, jump off. So I, I thank all of you so much for this opportunity, really. Thank you so fun. much. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, for sure, thanks, Daryl. Rebecca Coleman, we're gonna pass it over to you if you could tell us what you're running for um, and then we're gonna go into the question about community work. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to come. I was in a rally earlier and it went over a little bit, but I'm, my name is Rebecca R. Coleman. I'm running for judge of the 32A district court in Hartford Woods. I'm running on the platform of change. I noticed, especially in the court, and I plan to bring that. We need multiple programs that really help people to get on the right path towards success, um, such as literacy training in the probation department sobriety, drug treatment. Those have been some of the main contributing factors that I've noticed um, in practicing criminal law. And we kind of just tell people sometimes, hey, do X, Y, Z, but uh, we tell them to do X, Y, Z, but they don't have the proper tools in order to do so. And so I want to help bring those things to the city of Harbor Woods. Um, in addition to that, um, I've been practicing law for the last 10 years, doing primarily criminal work and probate work and some bankruptcy, um, but I have had experience in all areas of law in the district court. Um, some of the volunteer work that I do, I'm the performing arts department, I think that is very important for children to have experience in all different areas of learning. A lot of times the performing arts is, is left behind and we only focus on math and science, but there's talent in different domains and so I try to bring that out of the children. Um, I teach dance as well as um, different theater things. I, I do have a background in theater. That's what my bachelor's is in. Um, I also um, mentor some of the young women in the city of Harbor Woods and some other women who want to go down the legal path. So I make sure that I bring them to court with me and show them just like different core operations, um, show them how to do um, different things in, involving um, being a lawyer. Um, and I do at least one pro bono expungement a year. And I sponsor an incoming freshman that is a young lady from a public school. I sponsor her book textbooks for her first year of college. Okay. And so I just want to ask um, another question um, referring to the cash bail system. I know uh, Judge Hood has to go soon. So we're going to pass it to you first. Um, what are your thoughts on the cash bail system and how you would reform it? I know you said a little bit about it, I believe in your survey, but if you could um, speak on it just for a little bit for us. Absolutely, and not to be too redundant from my survey response, um, my view on it, at least as it relates to the state system, um, a lot of it, it 
a lot of it is already in the court rule. I mean, if you read closely Michigan Court Rule 6.106, it really provides a framework that I think a lot of people are advocating for. The problem is we don't necessarily have judges uniformly reading and applying that court rule. And the two primary concerns are, is someone gonna show up as required and is the community going to be safe while they're out on bond? And the whole point of a uh, surety or cash bail is to create a financial disincentive for someone to either flee or commit other crimes so that they'll behave while out on bond. If someone doesn't have any money at all and you're setting, uh, let me put it a different way. If you're setting a fixed amount based on the type of crime without taking into account the financial resources, the litigant in front of you, you're doing it backward. I mean, some of these resources are already there. SCALE, this is the State Court Administrative Office, has a form, it's Form 287, which is a blank financial statement. And every time someone is asking for a reduction in bond from whatever was said at the district court, I say, fill this form out. And we may already know that the person doesn't have any assets and has a ton of liabilities, but have them fill it out and sign it under the pains and penalties of perjury so that then I can make an informed judgment about what's a reasonable bond for this person, which may very well be a personal bond. In my view, COVID has forced us to confront this and frankly, read the court rule. And I try to, I try to apply that in every single case and apply it fairly. And really we just, we have to hold our judges accountable and I'm, I'm trying to hold myself accountable to follow it. I mean, obviously there are reforms that can be made, but it starts with working with, like right now, it's already written, large part of it is already written down there. We just need to follow it. Yeah. And then I'm gonna jump over to Ms. Baker. Yes, well, as Judge Hood just indicated, the two reasons are, you know, the safety of the community and whether they are fight risks. And if you don't have either one of those, um, and this person is not able to afford it, I don't see any reason why they couldn't have a personal bond. And even with some assaultive crimes, being a person that has um, litigated criminal matters for the last nearly 13 years, I, I can always look at the preliminary exam and see how strong the state's case is. A lot of times what things appear to be aren't really what they are. And I think I would take the time to read those and make sure that um, people get the fair opportunity if um, they should be let out, even if it is an assaultive crime, because maybe the, the case isn't that strong. Your level, your um, <clears throat> um, when you go from 36 over to where we are, 36 is only, you know, probable cause that possibly that, you know, this person committed this crime is not beyond reasonable doubt like it would be if they came, you know, to Third Circuit and actually had a trial. So the standard is much lower. And so I think you, we just have to take the time to read and see what is there. And I can make that decision after seeing um, uh, the transcript from the preliminary exam as well. And then uh, Justice McCormick, your thoughts on the cash bail system? Or yeah, um, so I, I am the co-chair of the Governor's Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration, which, um, and, and we made a number of recommendations in the uh, neighborhood of bail, but let me just back up for one second to explain why I think this is such an important topic that we're all talking about and we have to keep talking about because we're not done with uh, pushing some of these reforms across the finish line. Um, we know, we knew that Michigan's county jail population had had tripled in the last 30 years, even though crime is at a 50 year low, and we had no statewide data to understand why that is. And not having good data is just a recurring um, reason for not getting anything done. Um, in the criminal justice system, in my view, I feel like we, you know, we, we always have like that excuse for not getting anything done. So with the help of the Pew Charitable Trust, we collected statewide data and understand now um, what is driving Michigan's county jail populations. Let me give you the short answer, poverty. Um, and um, in fact, the third most common reason people are, are lodged into county jails is driving with a suspended license. In Wayne County, it is the top reason people are lodged into the wing, in, into the county jail. Um, so with that data, we were able to um, bring a pretty diverse group of people. It was a bipartisan task force, state and county leaders, every kind of stakeholder. Um, uh, we did listen to the public around the state and surprisingly um, from Traverse City to Detroit to Grand Rapids, 
people were equally frustrated with uh, this front end of the criminal justice system. Bail is one part of that, but it's not the only part. Um, mm -hmm. And so we made a, a bunch of recommendations to um, make Michigan a national leader in jail and pretrial reform. And already 14 bills have passed unanimously out of the House that reflect those recommendations. Um, and seven bills are out of the Senate Judiciary Committee and onto the Senate floor. And I expect all of those to get to the governor's desk. Those were the ones that um, took uh, a lot of traffic misdemeanors and de declassified them, reclassified them. Sorry, it's like Friday night and my, my words are like not good anymore. Um, reclassified them to um, uh, civil infractions and also um, uh, disaggregated driving with a suspended license with from things that have nothing to do with driving safety. You can have your license suspended in Michigan for failure to pay a fine or a fee um, just because you can't, right? Or you weren't, you know, you weren't able to make that payment and your driver's license is automatically suspended. The next time you're pulled over, you, are, you must go to jail because that is a misdemeanor for which you must go to jail. It doesn't make any sense. This is Michigan. We have to drive to work, right? I mean, we want people to be able to go to work, pay their bills, pay their child support and take care of their families and like support their communities. So I, we, we're going to make a bunch of progress. The recommendations for um, the bail part of the, uh, the pretrial system are, have not yet been um, drafted into bills. We, we, will, we will get there. They're just the hardest. They're going to be the heaviest lift. So the lieutenant governor and I are uh, going to keep working on it, but we are uh, working on the easy parts first. Uh, easy parts because there's bipartisan interest in a lot of the recommendations. Um, but we need to um, rethink a lot of how we do um, uh, um, bail. I do agree with Judge Hood um, that I'll, uh, and, and um, uh, Ms. Baker that the court rule does give us a lot of tools to be able to, um, to if, if we actually pay attention to them. But we have to have um, quick review in the event somebody doesn't, uh, and none of the judges on here would ever do that. I know that because I know these people and they're excellent people. But if you had a judge who didn't, you would need someone to have quick review, which we don't now have. So that's one of the recommendations. Um, and we also need a lot more diversion um, before somebody ever goes to court. So a lot of our recommendations were, we should have diversion programs for substance abuse, mental health um, uh, issues, before somebody ever gets taken to see a judge, right? So let's treat the reasons um, why somebody is, uh, has found themselves in trouble instead of um, turning every problem into a criminal justice problem. They don't all have to be criminal justice problems, but it's an issue I care a lot about and I'm gonna be working on it for a while. How can the community support um, the work that you and uh, Lieutenant uh, Governor Gilchrist are doing um, around reform for cash bail? Is there- Yeah, there is a lot. We have a, the ACLU Smart Justice Project. Um, we have a lot of community support for, in fact, it was pretty critical at a lot of our public meetings, the people that showed up to give public testimony. But I will put in the chat um, the task force report and also uh, the, um, the website that, that shows you all of the bills and where they are so you can follow them, um, as well as just all of the information to, that we update constantly about what's happening and where it is. And that way you, you will know when there are bill hearings and, you know, if you, for, for the community that cares, they can say so, right, and voice their, voice their support. I'll put all that in the chat. Thank you. And then uh, we're going to jump over to Ms. Coleman. Uh, same question. Cash bill. Okay, um, I believe just like the other panelists has indi have indicated, just understanding the court rule and actually applying it to the case. Um, you know, I don't believe that people should be punished for not being able to afford their bail. Um, you know, and that can hinder the family. It can also hinder job stability. It can hinder a lot of things. And so we have to really, really take into consideration or follow what the, what the court rules say and see if they're, what is the threat to the community and are they a flight risk? And if you don't see those items, then, you know, personal bond is maybe in order. So like, like I said, just follow the court rule. Yeah. And then Judge Sabri. So I pretty much agree with what everyone else said. Um, I do want to say, uh, Justice McCormick, before you jumped on, I was complaining about 
misdemeanors as far as no insurance, no registration. So I am elated that there's going to be a reclassification soon. I'm pretty tired of entering guilty pleas for offenses that people just can't afford. We're getting um, that done. We're getting that I, done. I'm more than happy. That's I'm happy about that. And also um, at 36 district court, we are also, we have also gone to uh, our zero. I mentioned that too. We're at zero dollars for our bonds. Uh, so anyone who is stopped for a traffic offense and pretty much all misdemeanor offenses, they will not be incarcerated for those offenses. They will get a court date as they would for a civil infraction. Um, so my opinion on cash bail, I, I, I don't think that, so I've, I've sat on preliminary exams and there are times where well, the issue with a lot of judges is it's all over the place. For the same exact offense, someone could say your bond is $250,000 and another judge say $100,000. One thing we don't know is what people can pay. There are some people who can post their mother's house and just get out on bond. So really the issue goes back to, are they a threat to the community and are a flight, flight risk? If those are the things that you think that this defendant uh, exhibits, you should just remand the person and they should have to sit and wait for their next trial date. If not, you can just let them go on a personal bond. And if you are nervous about that, we have other options, tethers we can put on the person. I don't know how effective they are, but they're an alternative to uh, posting or having someone post a bond that's unreasonable that you can't, or just trying to figure out what someone should or could be able to pay. It becomes more of a trying to figure out someone's wealth or asking them questions about their job and then trying to figure out how much money they make to set a certain bond. If you don't think the person should be out on the community and the street for those two reasons, then they should be remanded. If not, set a personal bond or put a tether on them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We're getting ready to wrap up. And so we want to give everybody an exit, um, a time to exit. Tell us about um, some things you would like to see or tell us about your race. I know some people are running uncontested. I know some people, um, these are historic races. Um, so if you guys could just give us a little bit more information and to tell us how to reach you guys, um, that would be great. And we're going to start with Judge Hood because I don't know when you have to jump off. So I just keep going to you first. I, appreciate it. I, I apologize. I had marked down that this was until seven and I didn't realize it was until 730. So you got my apology for that. Again, my name is Noah P. Hood judge on Wayne County Circuit Court, but on your ballot, it will show up as Third Judicial Circuit of Michigan. And I'm running unopposed in a pack of 15 candidates, but I wanted to be here tonight because I think probably for unopposed races, it's as if not more important that you understand who it is that's out there representing you. Uh, because oftentimes our citizenry, um, the courts are the first and only contact with the government. And um, like I said before, you know, I, I commit to fairness, to integrity and intelligence every single day. And um, I am honored to be in this position and would be honored to have your vote. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Coleman. Again, my name is Rebecca R. Coleman. I'm running for 32A District Court in Harper Woods. And I wanna thank Force Detroit for allowing me to be here um, in talking about my campaign, this is a historical campaign. Once I am elected, I will be the first female as well as the first Black judge the city of Harbor Woods has ever had. So it is vitally important for everyone to come out and vote. Um, anyway, I'm a strong advocate for voting. Um, it's the African Americans has only had the right in women for 55 years. So we must get out and vote. I can't say that enough. I'm trying to bring change to the city of Harper Woods because it's time. We need programs. We need all types of resources there. And I am the person who's going to bring that and make sure that the judiciary is held accountable in the city of Harper Woods. So again, Rebecca R. Coleman, I'm on ColemanForJudge.com spelled out. And the email is rcoleman for judge the number four at gmail.com. And then Judge Sabri, thank you so much, Rebecca. So I'm actually not on the ballot, but I'm going to use this time to speak about all of the other candidates. Thank so you. I actually know them all pretty well. So I know Judge Hood from middle school. I know his parents. 
I know where he comes from. He is a phenomenal person, great attorney, great judge. Um, I always tell anyone who asks me, people always ask judges, who should I vote for? It's a no, it's a no question. So um, Noah, that's your plug. Um, Chandra Baker, we were prosecutors together, Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, and she helped me become a better litigator. Uh, we had a case where a victim was shot nine times and um, she helped walk me through that whole trial and gave me so many tips and her whole charisma and just being a black woman in the prosecutor's office and not being that type of woman saying like, I wanna be the star. She's like, who do you wanna question? What do you wanna do? She just gave me the reins and just showed me the way and also gave me some very constructive criticism. So Chandra, um, also another great candidate and I'm excited to see you in the black robe soon. Uh, Justice McCormick, I voted for you in 2012. I was a delegate at the Democratic Convention. I remember we came on the stage and I've been a fan ever since. And I love what you're doing. You are making, you don't even probably know it, but you're making our lives better on the bench down at the district court level. Um, we've had so much relief from you being the Chief Justice. So um, everyone listening, please also vote for Justice McCormick and keep her in her spot. Um, a lot of times people don't realize who they have in positions and they forget, but you know, you got to still vote for those and appreciate those that are there. And lastly, Rebecca Coleman, um, she's been practicing. We're about the same age as far as practicing law. And she's been in my courtroom. We were attorneys together. I was a prosecutor. She was a defense attorney and she is great as well. Um, her father's on the bench at 36 district court. Um, and she's just a phenomenal woman. And I also am saying vote for her as well. So I'm using this time to say for everyone listening, you all have actually have great candidates. I'm a very blunt person. If I didn't feel that way, I wouldn't say it. So everyone on here, make sure you vote for all four candidates and Welch too, even though she's not here. Thank you. <laughs> and then Ms. Baker. Thank you. Well, first of all, I wanna thank um, uh, NAACP and Forest Detroit for allowing me to come on. Um, I also want to indicate that I am running for Wayne County Third Circuit Court Judge. There are two openings. Um, there are four people that are running and I want to be one of your candidates. I am on Facebook at Chandra Baker for Judge. I'm also there just playing Chandra Baker and then I have a website of bakerforblindjustice.com if you want to look up me, look up and get more information about my background, I am endorsed by many individuals. I'm endorsed by the Free Press, actually. I'm also, um, I received the outstanding rating from the Detroit Bar Association, which is the organization that rates the candidates for these positions by our peers. They are judges and attorneys, and I received the highest rating. And I'm also endorsed by Fannie Lou Hamer and the Black Slate, uh, the UAW, AFL, CFO, ASME, and an a host of other judges and individuals. I'm also endorsed by Judge Hood. So uh, I'm sorry, Reverend Hood, as <laughs> and, and, and maybe Judge Hood too. So um, I just look for your vote. I ask you to vote for me again. Only the top two people can win. And I just look forward to making change. I look forward to being fair. I look forward to just having empathy. I just look forward to doing so much for the residents of Wayne County. And um, I just want to be your next jurors. Thank you. And then Justice, Justice McCormick, if you could take it away for us. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for convening this important conversation. I, I, I've been a, a lawyer slash judge for almost 30 years and I started my career as a public defender in New York City. Um, and I don't think I've ever experienced quite the interest and um, I think uh, robust deep and broad conversation about our justice system, like the one our nation is finally having right now. And you have some tremendous judges on here, some tremendous candidates on here. And um, I did not know Ms. Coleman before, but I'm super impressed with, with you and excited, uh, excited to have you as a colleague as well. Um, the people that um, you're seeing here today are, really can make a difference in the kind of justice, the quality of justice people get in our courtrooms. The, the, there is no reason the justice system can't heal. It can heal, mm -hmm. it can, um, if we want it to. And if you elect people who want it to, it will do that. 
So I am uh, very, very excited that you that you are having these conversations. Um, hope hope to be back for more. Let's let's keep having them even after the election. Um, we should decide what we want our justice system to be. And you have such a tremendous group of leaders, just the ones I'm looking at right here, and there are many others um, that we can be. Michigan can be a national leader. Let's let's get it done. I, I wish Elizabeth was still on. I, I, I'm voting for Elizabeth Welch as well. It's an open seat on the Supreme Court this year. I want someone with her values in that open seat. Thank you, thank you. And so that's gonna conclude our town hall on Judge the Vote. Um, this is part of our Free Our People, Free Our Wallets town hall series. We're always fighting to end the criminalization of poverty and to bring um, knowledge to the things that are going on that affect us, including um, this nonpartisan part of the ballot that often gets overlooked. So we appreciate everybody who tuned in with us. Um, if you have more questions, they told you um, where you can reach them, where you can reach out to us and we'll connect you um, or if you need help going through your ballot you can reach out to us we help with that as well thank you everybody enjoy your weekends be safe thank, thank you. you thank everybody. you thank you